Um, <laughs> I, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't have any symptoms, but I'm at a very high risk of suddenly dying. Uh, the risk was quoted to me as 2 to 3% per year of compounding. So, uh, and I was diagnosed at age 31. And so the chances of dying by the time I was 40 were very high. Um, and the doctors prescribed a pacemaker defibrillator saying, not to worry, your big risk is sudden death and we have a device that will do, you know, that will save you from sudden death if you go into, sudden death is actually the medical term, um, which is insane. <laughs> but if you go into sudden death, you'll get a shock and you'll be fine and, um, and they gave one to me to hold. Um, saying, look how small and you know cute it is. It's it, it, it's you know totally safe. And I, my first question was, what does it run? <laughs> and of course, no, you know none of the doctors knew the answer to that question. They hadn't actually thought about the fact that software was running these devices. So I I did all this research because I was a lawyer at the Software Freedom Law Center at the time. And how many technically savvy lawyers are diagnosed with a her condition where they have to get a his nigger defibrillator? Um, and so I, I took this on and I, I delayed getting the device for a while um, because I was sure that if I did the research I would see that there was the right regulatory approach in the United States and that, that in fact these devices were really safe. Um, I asked the medical device manufacturers if I could look at the software and they all said no. Um, I offered to sign a non-disclosure agreement, uh, being the good lawyer that I am, you know, <laughs> and uh, they, they said no. And I got to the point where I was sort of like, You're, you want to literally like sew this software into my body and connect it and screw it into my heart and you won't let me take a look at it. Like, this is insane. So FDA, surely, Food and Drug Administration of the United States, you were doing this for me. Um, but it turns out that uh, the software itself is, source code is almost never reviewed by the Food and Drug Administration and it's true in um, all the countries that I have researched, uh, which is not every country, but um, I'm unaware of any countries that are systematically reviewing source code. We're still, of course, because they're not reviewing the source code, they're not asking for copies, so there's no public repository. Um, I went with a Medtronic device because uh, doctors like Medtronic, it supports, uh, they have good support, and they've been around for a while, um, but uh, you know, if Medtronic goes into catastrophic failure, you know, if there's bankruptcy and a disaster, then uh, you know, this, this device is then useless. And uh, anyway, it, would, it, it was terrifying to me that the software that is literally in my body is not something that I could even review, let alone, you know, test or, or you know, do anything else elsewhere. Um, and so, all this to say that uh, I'm a cyborg with proprietary software screwed into my heart. Um, so, uh, the talk that I give um, about this, that's specifically about this, I start out by talking about medical devices and how, for me, I have this medical device and I'm at risk of, of dying and, um, and I have to rely on this scary, scary software but when you look at it more closely, as most of you probably know, there's software in almost everything that we're using. And so I can talk about things like, you know, what about all the software that's in our cars, in our voting machines, and in our stock markets? So it's not just my life, and it's not just the lives of the people that you all love, it's also all the other software that we're relying on for society and life critical functionality. So when I talk to people who are less in the know than you guys, um, this is like a mind-blowing realization and, um, and, and, and people are, 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 are terrified and they come to the conclusion that, you know, the world is a scary place. And I, I can't disagree with that. Um, I'd like to apologize on behalf of Americans <laughs> for the surveillance. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that the state of our software, and I, I wound up sitting in the, um, in the dystopia room, uh, for this morning because uh, a lot of these issues that I've been thinking about were, were talked about issues of um, identity, issues of, you know, who are we and how does that, how are we defined by our software and uh, what does it mean for our, our freedom and our privacy and, and who we are. Um, this next slide, I have changed like 10 times. Um, when I give my medical devices talk, I say free software is better and safer over time. And that's true, um, and I'm, I'm a strong advocate for that, and I think that 
um, when software gets enough attention, that is true. But the way this slide read before was, and I'm just too much of a lawyer to actually put it on a slide, is free software is not necessarily safer or better. And everybody here probably knows that because as free software developers and users, we know that free software gets developed out in the open. We release early, we release often, we work on it together. There are, you know, the stuff that gets better and safer over time is the stuff that everybody buys into, that everybody uses, that, you know, we all can review, that we all can improve. Um, but um, it's, 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 it's not necessarily the case that free software is, is, is better and safer from the get-go. Um, it's everything else that we put into um, free software that makes it better and safer. And the fact that the way that free software is foundationally allows that to happen where proprietary software doesn't. And I like to think of it as free software being like an ethical cornerstone uh, for the way technology should be. I think there's been a lot of inspiration from, uh, you know, from the free software community. I think the, uh, the free culture world probably wouldn't exist without the free software world. The concepts of free software have been very per pervasive um, and I think um, a bit intoxicating in a way and exciting. Um, but I would say that it's actually not enough. I, I started out as a lawyer at the Software Freedom Law Center and you know a lot of what I did. Well, I did a lot of like nonprofit and corporation stuff, but uh, but I also you know obviously did a lot of licensing work. And you know when I started, I thought free and open source software was all about licensing and the freedom from you know from copyright maximalism. And that seemed to be enough at the time. There were so many alternatives that we were being you know, that were being built. And I think the fact that there was so much useful software that was under a free license meant that the tools were being spread so quickly and that freedom was on the move. And that was really exciting. Um, but now I, I worry because I think we're sort of in a situation where the software solutions that we're using are becoming so critical and so much a part of who we are as a society that it, it, it's terrifying to me. I'm gonna ask you guys to confess, okay? How many people here have used Skype I confess. <laughs> at least once in the last two months? Okay, almost everybody raised their hand. This is a room of free software, I mean, it's FS cons, right? We are people who understand that we don't want Microsoft controlling our destiny, we don't want Microsoft controlling our phone calls, and yet we're all using Skype. It's crazy, and I don't want to stand up, you know, I, I, I I, I avoid as much proprietary software as I possibly can. I like to say that the proprietary software I use is in my defibrillator and um, my camera, and then the other software that I encounter from time to time, like you know, cash machines and things like that. You know, but I, I understand that it's not you know in some bits in my mobile that I can't you know radio that I, I can't uh, eradicate. But but the truth is that it's not. I think. I can't ask every one of you to never use proprietary software where you can avoid it. And because we, you know, we are in a situation where it's become such an inherent part of how we function in society and how we interact with our loved ones. My, my in-laws just want to see their daughter on, the, <laughs> on their computer screen. They don't, they don't understand why I want to say, no, actually, I don't want to use proprietary software. And I think that, the use of Skype, in addition to a lot of other, I'll just call it surveillance technology, and not have to go into it too deeply, because again, everybody here is, uh, is, is pretty savvy, but uh, the pervasive use of surveillance technology and other kinds of um, software, it's, it shows all of the other issues that are wrapped up in software and how it's so important for us. So even while we're building free software solutions, we have to worry about so many other issues. We have to worry about privacy and security, about the state of our data and what happens to it, um, about who can use it, can everybody use it, what happens you know, to, to people who are blind or deaf, or what happens when we get older and our vision starts to go. Um, and we need to worry about the communities that are building our software, because um, this conference is actually pretty good diversity-wise, which is sad. Um, 
because we we are a pretty homogeneous community and we're um, it is pro problematic for us because it it makes us myopic as you know as to what kinds of solutions are the right solutions. So I'll get back to some of these points um, a little bit later, but um, but I really think that. We, as responsible technologists, and I think anyone who could find their way in the door to FS comps is a smart, you know, savvy person, and or you know, or or on their way to being one. <laughs> and I think that um, we have a responsibility to explain that there is an ethical component to technology. I think a lot of people think about technology as a tool, and you know, asking them to care about morality of their software or the ethics of any of the technology is like asking them to care about the morality or the ethics of a hammer. You know, it's, it's hard to get people to understand, you know, why some of these issues might actually be important. But I think if every one of you becomes an activist for ethical technology, we will be in a much better spot. For me, um, somewhat obviously, um, I choose GNOME, and uh, I work hard for, you know, for the cause of GNOME because there are a lot of solutions in the desktop space, um, but GNOME is a way of, uh, are there, do you want to say anything? No, 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 no. okay. <laughs> uh, GNOME is a way that, uh, uh, you know, to get people to use computers who, you know, to get anyone to be able to use a computer, uh, which is sort of like the entry point of free software. And, um, and because we're a nonprofit project organized ideologically, we are in a, in a situation to address some of these issues that I think have become so important. And we can help build the tools and alternatives to, um, to have ethical technology, which I think is, has been sort of sadly missing in the mainstream. So I'm using Kodoma as an example, but um, you know, it, could be, it could be a lot of other things. Um, we, we ran an accessibility campaign um, a couple of years ago because when we switched from, so GNOME 2 was actually like an award-winning uh, uh, project for accessibility and, um, and it had made um, some pretty good strides uh, in accessibility. And then when GNOME 3 came along, because we released early and often, GNOME 3 was not very accessible for GNOME 3.0 and, and 3.2, but now we're on 3.10. And because the community chose to invest so much in accessibility, now GNOME 310 is one of the best uh, distros, uh, best desktops for accessibility. And accessibility is one of those things that is exactly these societal, these societal good ideas that companies can't necessarily look after. So there are plenty of companies that are making assistive technologies, right? There's a company called Jaws. There are a lot of companies that are, are making their living out of this. And what they do is they sell expensive licenses for, um, for software that they then give cheap or free licenses to students and to certain employers. And then what happens is people use these technologies, they get comfortable with them, they rely on them. And then the moment they graduate from school or the moment that they you know, get laid off from their job, they no longer have any ability to use their computer anymore, which is exactly the kind of situation where free software makes a heck of a lot of sense. If you use free software, for accessibility, then no one can take it away from you. And if there's a problem, you can fix it. You can hire someone to fix it, or you can, you know, you, there, you can somehow throw resources at this issue. Accessibility is one of those things where it shouldn't be an expensive license that you're stuck at your, you know, you're stuck at an employer that you're not happy with, or, um, or you're afraid that when you graduate, if you don't find a job, you'll be stuck without any computer use. It's crazy. Um, we also uh, ran a privacy campaign, which there's been so much talk about um, privacy here that I probably won't delve too much on it. Um, but a, you know, a free software nonprofit organization, you know, organization and, and grouping of people can focus on issues like this that are ideological. We can focus on these like sort of conceptual ethical things, whereas companies that drive software development, whether it's proprietary software development or even free and open source software development, aren't necessarily going to be that invested in these issues. We can come together as a society around a nonprofit with volunteerism and figuring out how to get companies to work together to solve some of these problems that otherwise we would just be stuck with.
and I think that, um, you know, one of the things about GNOME is that it operates in a space where a lot of the, um, the alternatives are, you know, are driven by single companies. And I think that's really dangerous in the long haul because you're beholden to one company or, you know, or, or uh, you know, one business model in order for, for you to succeed. And then another initiative that I'm going to talk a lot more about because I think everyone here is in a position to uh, potentially um, join in this particular um, effort is that we also have an outreach program for women. So, um, at, I don't know if everybody here knows just how bleak the statistics are for, um, for women and free and open source software. It's, it blew my mind when I actually tracked down the statistics because I thought, okay, well there aren't a lot of women. I went to engineering school, there weren't that many women there either. You know, women in technology, I'm not so sure. And I was one of those people who never wanted to talk about the, you know, women in technology. I never, when I was in engineering school, I would get furious if someone would want to talk to me about what I thought about being a woman in engineering. I was, you know, I didn't want an issue made because I thought um, plenty of times when people were asking me about it it's because they were set out to prove that I shouldn't be there, that I, I was there because I was a woman and I got special treatment, um, and I got very defensive about it. But it, when I came, and I thought the only way to really fix this problem is for the women that are here to be so awesome that you know no one would ever question the fact that they should be there. And so I just need to work as hard as I can to be as good as I can to be an example that women should be here, and then more women will join and will solve this problem. And then when I um, then I went to law school. Then I came back to free software, and I was like, holy cow, it's so bad. And I just had all this anecdotal experience for me personally of, you know, of a lot of, a lot of subtle sexism and a lot of like overt sexism, like checking in at conferences uh, with, uh, with a friend, and they would assume that the friend was the speaker and I was his wife. You know, like, I mean, so many things. So many times I would say something in a, you know, I would, I would have an idea and then someone else would say it later and they would attribute it to him. You know, like so many things over and over and over again that when I tracked down the statistics, I finally, I was just, like it made me feel a little saner to realize how bad the percentages were. So 25% uh, of all software developers are women. This is actually much lower than it used to be. It used to be a third and now it's a quarter. So in fact, what I thought was just get more women doing awesome stuff. I'm not sure what has happened, but <laughs> but women have actually been leaving uh, software. Uh, so it's been on the decline. And you can see this because 18% of, uh, actually, 18% uh, of students are, uh, I think this is actually, look, this is actually, this slide should actually say 18% uh, of, um, 18% of uh, proprietary software developers are women. Uh, and actually, uh, in free software, it's only, 3% uh, is actually the generous percentage. It's actually 1 to 3% are the statistics that I've seen. So however you slice it, even though there aren't that many women in software, there are really no women in free software. Like we are, we are just, we're an order of magnitude off. You know, if you take the one percent, you know, it, it's 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 kind of crazy. And so there are women in software. There are talented women in free software or in in software development generally, but we're just they're just not coming to our community. Um, there might be a lot of reasons for this. I'm not really that interested in trying to figure out why. Um, I just want to figure out what we can do about it. Um, so if you're interested, I'd say check out the Geek Feminism Wiki and um, uh, Freeze and. Uh, Free as in sexist, which uh, is a more systematic uh, discussion of sexism in the free software community. Um, so I won't, I won't delve on that because I think for me it doesn't really matter why women are staying away. I want to take all the reasons why we think they might be staying away and try to overcome them. So, um, uh, so this is uh, this is GNOME's participation in uh, Google Summer Code for a long time, where at most we would ever get one applicant. Um, who was a woman, which actually is quite good. Um, that we got any women at all applying was fantastic, but still quite bleak and, um, and seeing no real change. At Guadalc, which is our annual conference, uh, which I might add, where there's a bid to hold Guadalc in 2015 um, in the city. So if you're interested in helping out, you should uh, see these two people who I will 
um, later identify also. <laughs> um, so at Guadalc, we had 4% women, which is, again, better than average, but still really not so good. So we instituted our outreach program for women, which I'm going to tell you all about. And um, this past year, we had 18% women. So we've actually done a, a, a pretty good job. More good stats. In uh, 2012 and 2013, we had five and six, respectively, women who were uh, GSOC participants at Summer Code. Um, so we're sort of getting to that 18%, uh, which is pretty great. Uh, there was a study done amongst uh, free software projects to serving newcomers. And um, in that survey, 50% of respondents from Gnome were women um, versus 6% from uh, the next highest project. But most amazingly is that in our um, survey, we had 22 women respond. And in the rest of the survey, all of the other projects combined had 20 women. Uh, which is kind of, and this is just women who are new to our project, so just people who had uh, contributed to GNOME for like the last year. So uh, how we do it, um, as I said, we systematically look at the reasons why we think women might be staying away and we try to address them, provide a solution. One thing is we, uh, we address women directly. The program is for women. Um, the flyers uh, specifically invite women, and you think that might not be a big deal, but a lot of the women that come into RH Program for Women um, who are coders or would otherwise qualify for Summer of Code say that they wouldn't have applied to Summer of Code because they thought the program wasn't for them. Um, and there are a whole host of permutations of that, whether it's they thought they, you know, the program was, uh, you know, was they weren't good enough for the program or, or whatever. Um, and uh, so we address women directly and we invite them to, uh, to participate. Um, we accept uh, non-students, which is really key. Women in particular, um, but people generally, but women in particular have a lot of stages of their lives and it's really, um, um, it's been really amazing to not limit our program to students because it means that women who just had a baby or, um, or another state of their life will participate and it, it sort of gets their career back on track and helps overcome some of the, the sexism that is present in our society more generally. Um, and we accept non-coders because it's a good way to get more women um, to be invested and interested in free software and to continue to contribute. Um, we, uh, we identify mentors because uh, studies have found that women are less likely to be more aggressive with contacting people to be their mentors. Um, uh, we require a contribution as part of the application. So uh, Marina Taylor, who uh, runs the program with me at GNOME, had this like brainwave and then realized that one of the biggest obstacles for getting women into free software is getting them started, that they don't even make their first contribution. And so as part of the outreach program for women process, we have all these mentors that are available during this identified period in an identified place who will walk women you know, through the steps of contributing before the program even starts. So the flip side of that is that we know that the women who are good applicants already know how to use Git and you know, are already started and up and running and know what to do. So it has improved our applications, um, but also provides a, a, a service of its own. So we get many more applicants than we can accept. Um, but all of those women go away. So even the women we turn away have experience with contributing to a free and open source software project when they are finished with the application process. Um, and we, uh, you know, we put this flyer up and um, spread the word. Um, during the program, What's different from GSOC? GSOC was like a big inspiration for, um, for Outreach Program for Women. Um, I don't think Outreach Program for Women could exist without the Google Summer of Code. Um, and I think the programs really work together. So even though I'm comparing to Summer of Code, it's not really necessarily, it's not really a criticism of Summer of Code. It's just saying things that we do more proactively to get women to participate in our, um, in our projects. So unlike GSOC, where there might be an ambitious program for the summer in um, OPW, we try to encourage more manageable tasks. Um, and I find that uh, we had a, a, a marketing intern this past term who uh, we had identified a lot of manageable tasks that we thought could conceivably take the entire internship, and she did them all during the application process. So, I mean, amazing stuff. So manageable tasks doesn't mean necessarily that they're not contributing a lot. It just means that we, we have small bite-sized things to get people started, and then they, as they do more, they can take on more. Um, and then they wind up defining their own tasks and seeing things that can be improved. Um, we require 
participants to blog, which is awesome because it means that if you go onto Planet Gnome, you'll see lots of women talking about Gnome and talking about their work, which changes the tenor of the project when you see a lot of women participating. Um, so that 18% 18 18 we had um, at Guadalajara wasn't all participants in outreach program for women because we have a friendly environment for women, so more women participate in our program. Um, we have supportive IRC channels and regular meetings, and I was also quite skeptical about this. The part of me that was still that engineering student who didn't want to talk about, you know, women in free, you know, women in technology, uh, didn't. I didn't really think necessarily that the support forums were going to be so valuable until I posted a uh, blog about a presentation I did, and the very first comment I got was "nice boobs." And I was like, really? Come on. I mean, I know these comments happen, but like, and they happen all the time, and I see them, but it was like I just posted, I posted, I was all excited, and you know, and I'm an experienced, you know, contributor. I, people know who I am. I'm pretty confident now that I'm doing good work and I should keep doing it, but even I sort of took a step back and was like, do I want to be doing this? It just drives you away immediately, and this happens all the time. And so I went onto the IRC channel, and I said, hey guys, look, this is what, listen to what just happened to me. And they were like, oh my god, that happened to me last week. And you know, it just helped to have a really supportive place where everybody could talk to each other. And um, I think that's very helpful. Another thing we do is we sponsor travel wherever it's possible. When people can, um, when participants can actually meet with their mentors and meet other people in the project, they're much more likely to continue to contribute. They're much more likely to understand the culture of your project and to continue, want to continue to contribute. And similarly, after the program, we like to continue mentor relationships wherever possible um, and, um, and help people sort of like we've created this network and it helps, uh, it, it helps to um, promote these women to continue their work and to take it to the next level. Um, and then, uh, most importantly, even for women that don't stick around, so people sort of talk about sticking around is the goal, is increasing the women we have in our community. But even the women who do not stick around still take these values of free software with them, which is valuable in and of itself. Um, so uh, we do things that try to incorporate, integrate uh, students into the community. We do things like we have a lightning talk session where all of our um, summer code and average program for women participants give um, give talks, and then we uh, at Quora, not this past year, but the year before, we did like a scavenger hunt type game where uh, we had questions that the newcomers had to ask of, um, of you know more established GNOME developers and take document the experience, and um, things like that are very helpful in getting uh, women or getting people more integrated in the community. Uh, we had like a, a little outreach yearbook so that it was like a physical thing that people could have at our conference, um, which was uh, useful. Just to have a souvenir, but also to see who each other was and to um, kind of, but Emily lets me use her page because uh, she was, she was uh, I was her mentor um, also in marketing and I like to use her as, her as an example because she, um, she came in as a, a marketing intern, she was a big fan of GNOME. She got turned down for the outreach program for women, but loved GNOME so much she stayed and kept contributing and then was accepted. We actually have a lot of um, participants who did not get in the first time kept continued contributing, and then are very strong applicants by the next time, next round, and Emily was one of those. But I really like to use Emily as an example because she had such a great experience integrating with the GNOME community that she went and she took some Python classes and then came back as a summer code student. And now she's just active in a number of different areas in GNOME, um, and that's that's pretty exciting. She's given talks about the Irish program for women, um, and that's another thing that is really great about the way that the program works out is that it, it creates these support networks and. Um, and really helps encourage the interest that these women have in, um, in our organization. And so people who have been in the program so often become mentors. So for example, Fabiana and Andreas both mentored us through the summer. Fabiana was actually an outreach program for women. Actually, you guys raise your hands again. So everyone knows where you are. Okay. So Fabiana was a participant in the outreach program for women. Then she and Andreas were mentors this past round, and now the intern that they mentored is now going to be a mentor. So it's like you just have this ever-feeding series of, of mentorship which is going on, which actually has helped us create better mentorship opportunities for everyone. So our, all of these things that we did for, um, for Irish Program for Women, now many of them we do for Summer of Code. And now it's a lot easier for everyone who wants to get involved, not just women. 
So, you know, if somebody wants to come in who's new and wants to contribute and doesn't know where to get started, our introductory materials are much stronger. We have a newcomer's tutorial. Uh, mentors are identified, so anyone can go talk to them. And we now require a contribution for Summer of Code, which is patient with GNOME as well. And, um, and then what was really exciting is that this program was so successful that we felt like we just could not keep it to just GNOME. So we have invited many other organizations to join us. And now the program has over 20, um, 20 participating organizations that cycle in and out for different rounds. We do two rounds a year, uh, one in the Northern Hemisphere summer and one in the Southern Hemisphere summer. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's actually quite amazing. Other uh, free software projects have had similar success with their program, for example, Wikimedia, uh, before joining Outreach Program for Women, had, I think, there's another, there's a talk about the Wikimedia gender gap tomorrow. I'm really excited to hear Lennox talk on that. But, um, so maybe there's more information there. But I think that up until they participated in Outreach Program for Women, Wikimedia had only ever had one applicant, one female applicant to Summer of Code. And then after participating in Outreach Program for Women one round, they had seven participants in Summer of Code. So it's quite amazing, um, and it works. The, the real requirements are that your project is truly free and open, um, that you have an independent community, and that you have awesome mentors. Because without awesome mentors, there's no point in having the program at all. Um, the participants just won't have a good experience. So I ask all of you, think about whether your project could join the Irish program for women. Um, it's amazing how much the program does. Um, feel free to come talk to me, or um, or you can email me, or um, or Marina. Um, you could join as an organization or as a mentor. Um, if you know a woman who is interested in technology or free software or software, um, encourage them to apply. Uh, we're coming up on a deadline this week, so it's probably a little late to get started now. But then there'll be another round um, alongside uh, Summer of Code, um, and then just tell people about it. Um, so I would say we've had more Summer of Code students since we had the program, uh, more newcomers, more fewer events, and people stick around a lot more. But there's so much further to go. I mean, this is sort of what I started talking about at the beginning of, um, of the talk. There's, um, you know, we're focusing on women because in a way, it's, it's just sort of like one of the most obvious problems with our communities, um, the fact that we're so unbalanced with the percentage of women, it made it a real, a really easy issue to pick, but there are so many other underrepresented groups, you know, that we should probably be addressing as well. Um, we really need an outreach program for kids. I think it's awesome that FSCONS has it, like a, a kid session. Um, I think uh, we need to do a lot more of that in free software, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think that, uh, you know, these are just sort of one example. I think making our communities more, um, you know, more inclusive will only help us achieve those other goals, um, you know, that we need to in order for free software to be relevant. I think if our communities are too myopic, we're just going to be creating solutions for ourselves, and um, that's really problematic. Having a diverse set of voices means that our software will be better, and I know that in GNOME it means that our software development process is more fun. Um, I think people have been more polite to each other since we've had more diversity. Um, and I think that, uh, that we can only be improved in this way. So for me, it's all about keeping the gut in GNOME. Um, I think, uh, for those of you who don't know, the gut in GNOME actually is GNU, um, for the GNU free software project. I think most people here probably know that. Um, GNU is not Unix. And it just, it, the fact that we pronounce the gut in GNOME, not everybody does, it doesn't matter. As long as you're talking about GNOME, it's fine, I don't care if you call it GNOME or GNOME or GNOME or GNOME or GNOME, whatever you want. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I like to call it GNOME because I like to remember that we're an ideological project and, and, and to never forget it because if for free, free software is facing so many more obstacles now than ever before, the success of free software in business has actually been somewhat detrimental to the idealism um, involved. I think a lot of our best advocates were involved, a lot of uh, our key core programmers were um, attracted to free software initially based on the ideals of it, but because companies have become so successful with the business model, I think 
a lot of those people have been hired, and there's nothing wrong with that's great. I think that's really awesome. But the focus has somewhat shifted. And I think that the idea of success has become one of popularity. And it, it's, it's problematic because it, it becomes harder to drive this idealistic approach to software. And when we're facing all of this proprietary software and surveillance software and open core and just so many network services, so many areas where free software alone and licensing doesn't necessarily stand a chance. Um, so I, I would sort of say that, you know, I want to, I, I phrase it as keeping the gut in GNOME because I want to remember that software should be ideological. And um, so I ask everybody here to become an activist. I know a lot of you are already. <laughs> I'm pretty excited about that. Um, but, uh, but help bring these ideals to your software. It's, you know, the only way that we can overcome the prevalence of relying on convenience is by rallying the resources to, cr to create alternatives. Um, and to explain why those alternatives are important in a way that everyone can understand. Um, so uh, ask your company to fund and join nonprofits. Um, a lot of free software is developed by big companies that have their own interests at heart. And when you choose solutions that are based on nonprofits, you're more likely to have a, you know, a solution that can embrace some of these other ideals. Um, and if your company is involved in the software, um, encourage them to you know, run by a nonprofit, encourage them to support the nonprofits because while the nonprofits dwindle, uh, which we've been seeing in the free software space, um, you know, it makes it much harder to remind people about all of this idealism and to provide a vehicle to come together. I mean, it's because no one has a foundation that we could have an accessibility campaign, that we could have a privacy campaign, that we can run the outreach program for women. I mean, the outreach program for women, when we run it, is not a, you know, it's not a company internship program. It's not, you know, it's, it's something more. And it's something that only, I, I believe, a nonprofit could do. Um, I think I've said everything else, avoid the convenience trap. But, uh, but be proactive in improving your community. So think holistically, what are the problems in my community? How is my software being used? Who is using it? How do people you know, interpret my, you know, the technology around us? And you know, think about ways to improve it. So an, uh, part of the reason why I want to talk about the outreach program for women is because I think many of you are involved in free software projects and participate. But the other reason I wanted to talk about it is that it's a really good example of looking at the problems that we have, figuring out what could be the reasons, and then coming up with solutions that help fix the problem. And if you could do that with across the board in free software, it will be so much better. And then lastly, I would be a bad executive director if I didn't tell you to use GNOME. <laughs> <laughs> How many people here are using GNOME? I, yeah, it's pretty, well. Wow. Oh my gosh, hooray, a vast majority. Um, <laughs> uh, well done, everyone. Um, and for those of you who didn't, uh, who haven't given it a try recently, this is a screenshot from 310. It's, um, it's awesome. And, no, uh, no, it's not as awesome. It's, it's GNOME. I use awesome. Oh, great. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, it, it's great. <laughs> um, and uh, GNOME is a charity, so uh, feel free to, to donate, become a friend of GNOME. Uh, you'll get a great uh, t-shirt uh, that uh, Andreas has designed. <laughs> and um, and uh, yeah, and the, the slide is this with? The t-shirt is all right. No, I think it's pretty great. I think it's pretty great. And uh, uh, I like to really like this my talk, so feel free to reproduce. So, thank you very much.
the free software data varies really wildly in you know for anywhere from the one to three percent. But I've never seen anything. I, the, I saw one thing that was uh, five percent. That's global, not in the U.S. Uh, the free software stat. Um, I saw one that was five percent, but it's been widely disputed as being totally off. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, if you're in a group where there's no women and you want to get more women in the group, did you get women well, doing the same thing from another place, or how did you outreach when you have? It's really varied, actually, and I think one of the you didn't. You didn't mention this, but uh, but one of the big misunderstandings about the outreach program for women is that uh, mentors must be women, or that the organization, like the organization of the program, must be done by women. Um, but the truth is, if we relied on that, we would never get more women to free software. So in fact, it's it's mostly men that we rely on to become mentors because that's who's present in our projects. Um, so uh, so that's what, what was the question again? I got distracted on the. Um. How to do outreach when Ah, work. right. So it really depends on the project and what you're trying to do. So there are a lot of different ways that you can do it. The point about putting up the percentages was really to show that there are really talented women in software, but you're just not getting them in free software. Um, so one of the, the ways that we promote outreach program for women is by promoting it at universities. And universities that have become savvy to this have incorporated it a little bit into their, the, you know, sort of what they do. So we have certain universities apply a lot more to our program than others. Um, but then there are a lot of other situations um, where we've been able to promote it through word of mouth. I think that probably the most um, effective strategy has just been people who know about the program telling other talented people, talented women, that they should apply. And the fact that it, um, it's available to non-students has been really huge. Um, and what's been really great is to see women reboot their careers because um, they've taken a step away for some reason. And um, you know, the Linux kernel is a participant in the uh, the outreach program for women. Uh, this past round, they had seven women working on the Linux kernel, which uh, there are so few women who have been you know participating in the Linux kernel before. And um, and many of them have been recruited heavily for, for jobs afterwards. It's not a goal of our program, but it, it happens. So I think there are a lot of different ways that we can recruit them. I think that just being a participant in the program gets you some visibility. So now women know that this program, or some women know that this program is happening in some students, and so they go and they look at these, um, you know, at the, they look at all the projects and they find something that's suitable for them. And then, you know, as the mentors become engaged with, uh, with existing mentors, even if your project is not well known, they'll, you know, some of the talented women will get to you because they'll realize that they're, the mentors are already, you know, helping somebody else with their project. So like, you know, the two rounds ago, Wikimedia had so much initial interest that uh, they just weren't taking any other, you know, any any other applicants even uh, after the first, you know, the first week. But uh, but then uh, Subversion, who was a participant, Subversion, who had never had a single female contributor before, wound up getting a, a participant who had never heard of Subversion but was interested in similar technologies, and, um, and they had a great experience with her. So, any other questions? Uh, accessibility. A lot of nice things happening with the screen reader and, uh, mm -hmm. and the magnification. No, uh, but one thing that is frustrating, I think, in a you know, Linux environment altogether is the uh, difficulties to support the sort of wider needs of reading support in a good way. Uh, are there any plans for that? More than in your accessibility. Well, so we did just um, we did just do a whole bunch of uh, we funded a bunch of work for for document accessibility, so like PDF um, accessibility, so that will be somewhat helpful. There is still, you know, there's definitely work still to be done, um, but one of the other uh, key things that we've done at GNOME is we've made um, accessibility uh, on by default, uh, which I think is unusual in our space, but is, uh, it really speaks to the integration of accessibility um, you know, with the GNOME desktop. So if there are specific things that you'd like to um, inquire about, feel free to talk to me about it afterwards. There's, there's been a lot of work going on, and um, the document accessibility work that we've done is very, very recent, and we haven't really even published a report. It's what we did with our uh, with our friends of GNOME money uh, two years ago, and the results are just, you know, we're, we're just takes a long time. So we'll be publishing some more about that. Anybody else? Did we show? women students on computer science education is 
is very low also. Do you have any ideas for recruiting? By the time they get to Outreach Partner for Women, which is 18 or older, it's already too late, um, which is part of the reason why I mentioned that we need an outreach program for kids um, or, or, or kids' programs because um, we, have, we have a problem in attracting girls to technology. And there are a lot of other programs and initiatives that are working on that space. I think, um, you know, for when we were first starting Outreach Partner for Women and we could have, like, our, all of our interns sit around in a room together, and now we just had... Uh, 37 interns, so we're like a lot of people now. We had all of our mentors and students in a room, and we had uh, the women say what was their, you know, what brought them to free software, um, you know, what brought them to technology generally, and they went around the room, and, um, and by far the most common thing that brought these women into technology or made them think that they could do it was their fathers. Um, there was one woman in the room whose mother had been uh, involved in technology and one woman who uh, had a, a, a very charismatic teacher who took an interest in her. But for almost everyone, it was their dads. Um, and so I think that actually making this change is very close to home. If you know a little girl, you know, take an interest in, um, you know, in, in them and encourage them towards technology if they're so inclined. I know for me, you know, my father was incredibly influential, and uh, he, he was a developer, and he, he just, you know, assumed that I would be able to do anything, and therefore, I, I you know, the aptitude that I had would, was able to come out. I don't think that otherwise I would have necessarily. Um, so, you know, I think we need to, we need to have separate programs that, or adjacent programs at these conferences where we have kid tracks, sort of like, there's a little bit here, which is awesome. Yeah, so I'm following from that, I mean, that you have interesting to add. Yeah, you asked uh, what uh, brought girls to technology if this is going to make, have a snowball effect, because if you would ask a group of school kids, mostly boys, they, many of them would probably say it was a friend at school who brought them to technology. So girls are more curious not finding a friend at school who would bring them to technology. If there starts to be a few more, then that kind of snowball between friends. There are so many problems in, you know, that come out of social conditioning and subtle sexism that we don't even realize are in play. And I, I couldn't possibly think of ways to address them. I'm glad that there are other people working on it. <laughs> I think it should be commented that the same issue occurs also in, occurs in major sciences overall and in math in particular as well. That it's hard to recruit, it's harder to, to recruit students in general and it's even harder to recruit them. Yeah, there are particular fields in technology, but it's interesting that uh, you know some fields are much easier, like chemistry has a much easier time of attracting women than other fields, and it's you know evaluating what those things are. With math in particular, though, there was this recent study published that showed how when women get more you know get to the point of their careers where they might take it to the next level. So when they taking from the pool of undergraduate math students and getting them to both grad programs and to academic positions or other kinds of um, employment in math that there's a tremendous amount of, um, of discrimination that's baked into that. Um, and that, that's, that's most of where, or that's a big portion of where we lose women in math. Let me just ask about another person. Um, how many applicants were per mentor? It really varies by project. And it, you know, it varies by how exciting the project is by the way the mentor described it. Um, we've, last time we had like a, I think like 70 applicants or something like that for 37 positions. But, but bear in mind, we have a lot more interest in that. But in order to actually apply, you have to make contributions. Well, so, seven for one mentor. So for one mentor, it really, some mentors only have interest from, Subversion had zero interest originally. In GNOME. Oh, in GNOME. Also depends. Web, I would say probably, how many applicants do you guys get per uh, mentor? Seven, say seven. Right. Um, not all of them finish contributions, but Usually three or four finish contributions. Yeah. Uh, marketing also is one of those areas we get a lot of interest because people are sort of like, oh, cool, I can get started out with the code. Um, I think the kernel got a lot of. Uh, the kernel got a lot of applicants. The kernel got a massive amount of applicants. Yeah. So it really varies. It can be anywhere from zero to, pro I guess, as high as like 12, what I would guess. And then at that point, mentors can say, I'm not, I don't want to, I, I won't take any additional applicants. And we are pretty loose about it. So if you were to join and um, you know 
you were to say I can only handle three applicants, then that would be that would be it for that project. Anybody else? Did you want to? Okay. okay. Well, thank you guys so much. I'm going to be around all weekend, so um, I'm really excited to hear everybody else's talk. And uh, feel free to come and talk to me and tell me what you're doing and ways that we can improve. It's really awesome. Thank you. Thank you.